six, so let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, today, we're going to close the history section of the Old Testament with the books Ezra and Nehemiah. You'll remember last week we talked about First and Second Chronicles, which uh, were originally one work, and so we just talked about Chronicles last week. Um, what you'll find today is that Ezra and Nehemiah were also once one book uh, that had been divided in the modern Bible. Uh, but as we talked about Chronicles, we saw a few key points. Uh, and remember, Chronicles is out of place in our modern Old Testament. And so it feels a little weird because it's a recap of what has happened. And it breaks up the time timeline between Kings and Ezra and Nehemiah. So where we left off in Kings with the Babylonian exile is where we pick up the story in Ezra and Nehemiah. Only a good chunk of time has passed. And that Chronicles gets dropped in the middle uh, to offer hope to the Israelites who are still waiting for the return of their messianic kings. And you'll remember in that one we saw a few key themes, uh, the first of which was the glorification of David and Saul as kings. Remember the author took out all the bad that the kings did and just talked about them as being perfect. And that was a literary attempt to tie them back to Moses and forward to the messianic king in the attempt to give hope to the Israelites who now have rebuilt the temple, gone back to the Holy yes. Land, but have not seen this messianic king come and rule over all the nations. And the author sees the despair and the disappointment and tries to reinvigorate that. Uh, and so, the Chronicles kind of fills that need, offers a little bit of hope, but one of you after class last week said, how did people buy Chronicles? If, if it's lying about the perfection of David and Saul and some of those early leaders, wouldn't the people reading it know and kind of discredit it as a book? And, and what I pointed out uh, is that not everyone is reading the same scriptures at the same time in the ancient world. It takes a long time for all of these stories to get compiled into the Old Testament as we know it today. And so though someone in the Sinai Peninsula may be reading Chronicles, someone in the northern area of Atina may only be reading Kings. Right? And they don't know necessarily that the two exist or that they can compare literature to one another. It takes hundreds of years for the Old Testament to become one canon, and it takes hundreds of years after the life of Christ for the New Testament to become a canon. It's not until the five and six hundreds that we start to get a consistent idea of what the Christian Bible looks like. And so uh, we see all kinds of different uh, Gospels cropping up. We see all kinds of different books tied to the Old Testament cropping up. Some of them make it into the Bible, some of them don't. Uh, but we can't assume that people in one place of the world knew what was being written in another chunk of the world. It didn't quite work like that. Uh, so a really good question, um, but you know, people weren't fact-checking each other. They were writing as they understood it, uh, sending out that information, and then kind of assuming correctly that no one was going to catch them on anything that they might have missed. Okay, so today we're going to talk about Ezra and Nehemiah. And as I said, these were originally one book uh, that, have, that was cut in two when it made its way into the modern Bible. Most scholars think that Ezra and Nehemiah uh, are books written by the same author as First and Second Chronicles. Uh, how do scholars determine who wrote what when we don't know who the author is? A lot of that is based off uh, kind of keys within the text. What is the author talking about? What is the literary style that is being written in? An author kind of has a fingerprint that they can assign to the way in which they write text and tell stories. Uh, what facts do they know that puts it in a certain time frame, and period, and location? And we talked last week in First and Second Chronicles, we know that the author is writing retrospectively because he knows what happens in the end. So he's not writing in place, he's writing afterwards because he knows the answers to all the questions he's asking. And so most scholars believe that Ezra and Nehemiah are written by the same author as First and Second Chronicles. And as we get farther and farther in the Old Testament, it gets easier and easier to establish timelines uh, and overlap that with other pieces of world history because we start to line it up with empires that we know existed and can go and track the archaeology. So as we talked at the end of Kings, two things had happened to the Israelites. In Kings, North Israel and South Israel separate. They have that civil war. Uh, we've talked about that a couple of times now. The Northern Kingdom gets overrun by the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians are these big, bad, 
biker gang type mm -hmm. empire that resides right here, kind of southern Turkey into what is now uh, Iran, and they roll in and take out the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom, many years later, is taken by Babylon, and in each case, the people from Israel are sent into exile. And that's where Kings leaves us. The southern kingdom has fallen, the temple has been destroyed, and the Babylonians have taken the Israelites and placed them into exile. So, the northern kingdom gets taken over by Assyria in 722 B.C. The southern kingdom, and if you can remember back to, to kings, there's those last few chapters where the southern kingdom is existing without the northern kingdom and kind of laughing at the northern kingdom for losing. Uh, they fall in 539 B.C. So there's a big chunk of time between the fall of the north and the fall of the south. Now, 539 B.C. is when Pap... Uh, or, I'm sorry, that's the wrong date. That should be 586. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself a little bit. I shift gears in my train. Yeah, uh, important. Uh, 586 is when the southern kingdom falls and the ba Babylonian captivity starts. 586 is really the date that they think the temple actually fell. Um, most scholars can track the archaeology, and they say that the deportation of the Israelites starts in 605. And so it seems that the Babylonians were kind of rummaging around for a while, slowly taking uh, Israelites away, and then in 586 they decided to burn the whole thing down and finish off the exile. Okay. So then a bunch of time, this is where Kings ends, and then we see a bunch of time pass in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, describe a three-stage return from Babylon back to the Holy Land. And that starts in 538 B.C. And of course, B.C. moves backwards until we get to zero, and then we start the one the way that we're comfortable with, because that's how the calendars work. So, that gives us our timeline from the fall of the Northern Kingdom, the fall of the Southern Kingdom, and eventually the start of the return 538. Now the return does not happen all at once, and we're going to talk about that as we delve into the books. The return happens in stages as different kings release, release different segments of Jews. Um, and not all Israelites are exiled when the kingdoms fall. And that will become really important, especially as we look at Nehemiah, uh, Ezra. Uh, the big cities, of course, are attacked by Babylonians, but there's tons of fishing villages and farming communities Israelites are living, and the Babylonian army did not care to go to get the people and send them to exile. So throughout this 70-year exile, there are Israelites living in Babylon and throughout the Babylonian kingdom, and there are Israelites still living in the promised land. And enough time has passed that there's a whole generation of Israelites that have never been to the Holy Land. They were born in captivity, they grew up in captivity, they have assimilated into the Babylonian lifestyle. Uh, eventually, many Israelites become powerful people in Babylon. They become business leaders, they become assistants to the kings and to the royal courts. And so when the kings start to say, you can go back, not all the Israelites do. Some sit and say, the promised land means nothing to me. I've never been there, I've never known it. I have my life and my family here, and we're going to stay. So it's not like King Cyrus of Persia takes over Babylon and says, okay, we want to go home. And a massive exodus of Israelites leaves Babylon by the hundreds of thousands of turns to the promised land. Uh, it's incremental, it's slow, and it's not complete. Okay? And that, that's an important difference that we're going to delve into as we go through. Okay, so let's really delve into the books uh, and start at the very beginning. Okay, we're going to start in Ezra chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. And we'll actually just start in verse 1. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia's rule, to fulfill the Lord's words spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Persia's King Cyrus. The king issued a proclamation throughout his kingdom. It was also in writing that stated, Persia's King Cyrus says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem and Judah. If there are any of you who are from his people, may their God be with them. They may go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel, he who is the God who is in Jerusalem. 
And as for all those who remain in the various places where they are living, let the people of those places supply them with silver and gold and with goods and livestock, together with spontaneous gifts from God's house in Jerusalem. So the book starts with a new king that we've not met in entirety yet. Uh, and you may be thinking, I, I thought the Babylonians were in charge of Babylon and the Israelites. Why is the king of Persia releasing them from their captivity? Well, because empires rise and empires fall. And so Babylon had once been the big bad kingdom, and they did take the Israelites. But in 539, Persia, which comes from the east, sweeps over the Middle East. And we talked about King Cyrus last week. Uh, he was really good with PowerPoint presentations, and he would show up to a village uh, and say, uh, there are a lot of advantages to joining my empire. We build walls and aqueducts. We have education centers, and we can protect you. And if you say no, my army of 50,000 men is standing outside the walls, and we'll take you. Uh, so you can join or not, but one way or another, you will be part of Persia. So Persia just kind of blows through the Middle East. They capture Babylon in 539. Uh, and as we're told in Ezra, God speaks to Cyrus and tells him to release the Jews. Right? This fulfillment of a prophecy that we'll talk about a little bit later, in which the exile is supposed to last for these 70 years, and then they'll be released back home to rebuild again. And so King Cyrus says, go, rebuild the house of God, understand that to be the temple that the Babylonians had destroyed in Jerusalem decades earlier. And so, we see in Ezra 2, 64 through 68, that an assembly arrives in Israel. This assembly is led by the king, uh, the, uh, his name is hard to say, because <laughs> they all are, Zerubbabel. And how do you get a B sound from three Bs? Because you do. That's, that's ancient language. So Zerubbabel leads the Israelites back to Israel. And we get an idea of the number in that chapter 2, verse 64 chunk. The whole assembly together totaled 42,360, not including their 7,337 male and female servants. They also had 200 male and female singers, 736 horses, 245 mules, 435 camels, and 6,700 and 20 donkeys. They were very good record keepers, these, uh, these people coming back. And so again, 50,000 is far less than the total number of Israelites that did exist or do exist in the ancient world. Not all of them are going back at one time. King Cyrus has said to the king of the Israelites, take a small group, go back to Israel, and begin rebuilding your temple. So uh, there's some important things we find now in chapter the first thing they do when they get back to Israel, uh, back to Jerusalem, is really important and really good on them. They build an altar to God, and they start asking for forgiveness for all the mistakes. And there's some powerful institutional memory there. Remember, we're a full generation removed from the exile happening, uh, but the second generation and the elders among them know why the exile happened. Right? They chose to disobey God, to live out of covenant with God, and they remember that. And so the first thing they do when God lets them back into the promised land is say, we're sorry. We realize that we were wrong. We ignored you. We lived outside of the covenant that we were supposed to set with you. Our bad. We're sorry. And so they build an altar. They start sacrificing to God. Uh, and they beg for forgiveness. And you can see here in chapter 3 an important note. Verse 1. When the seventh month came and the Israelites were in their towns, the people gathered together as one in Jerusalem. Then Jeshua, Josadak's son, along with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, Shelatau's son, along with his kin, started to rebuild the altar of Israel's God so that they might offer entirely burnt offerings upon it as described in the instructions from Moses, the man of God. They set up the altar on its foundations because they were afraid of the neighboring peoples, and they offered entirely burnt offerings upon it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening offerings. Now, the seventh month is actually really important here. We can read that and just gloss over it and say, okay, we're getting a little context as to when they did it. But the seventh month in the Jewish calendar is critical to the way that they celebrate their faith. It's in the seventh month that the Jewish tradition does some of its most important holidays. And that matters. Remember, the Israelites know that they messed up. They know that they need, or want at least, to get back in God's graces. And so they sit and they wait until the seventh month before they start doing this worship. And that's because of these important festivals. The first is the festival, the Feast of the Trumpets. 
During the Feast of the Trumpets, the Israelites, uh, Jews still today, really place God above themselves. It's a celebration of the glory of God. The Feast of the Trumpets happens in the seventh month of the year. Uh, then they have the Day of Atonement, and we talked about that when we looked at Le Leviticus. Remember, the Atonement Festival is when they take the two goats and they sacrifice one and they place all their sins on the other and send it out into the desert, uh, literally their scapegoat. And we talked about that now over a month ago. Um, but so that atonement festival from Leviticus is carrying through here, uh, really important to these Israelites who are trying to show God that they're sorry for what they've done. Right? We're going to wait until we can do that atonement festival and get a little bit of good credit back in the bank. And finally, the Feast of the Tabernacles. And the Feast of the Tabernacles is maybe the most important symbolically for the Israelites in this moment. The Feast of the Tabernacles remembers and celebrates and thanks God uh, for the successful exodus out of Egypt and the eventual placement of the Israelites in the Holy Land. So, uh, all the way back to Exodus, they're exiled in Egypt, slaves of Pharaoh. They're released from Egypt, travel through the desert, and finally make it to the Promised Land. And during the Feast of the Tabernacles, they celebrate that event. Now, they've been exiled in Babylon, slaves to the king of Babylon for 70 years. They're coming back into the Holy Land, and so they're celebrating the Feast of the Tabernacles, waiting until the seventh month to rekindle this relationship, to build the altar, and to really go all out in this first celebration of what God has done for them and through them and with them. It's a reminder for the Israelites that even though they messed up to the greatest degree possible, God still gave them that second chance. And that's the thread we continue to pull through the Old Testament. That the Israelites choose to disobey instead of to obey. They choose themselves over God, yet God never quite gives up. He gets close, and a lot of times God wants to give up, and God wants to turn his back, and God wants to flood the whole thing again and try over, but he never gives up. God continues. So then, after they do all these festivals, and after they celebrate at the altar, it's time to get down to work. Remember, Cyrus sent them here for a reason. That reason was to rebuild the temple that the Babylonians destroyed. And so in chapters 3 through 6, we get this story of how the temple was rebuilt. And in chapters 3 through 6, we see the literary template that the rest of Ezra and Nehemiah is going to follow. One of the things you might have caught on to throughout the Old, Test Old Testament uh, is that the literary style of these books is often very important to the message that they're trying to relay. We see a lot of repeat things happening with different characters, and we see the same thing here in Ezra and Nehemiah. So each of the three stories we're going to read, first Zalababel, then Ezra, then Nehemiah, has three different components. The first component is a Persian king telling a leader to go home. Right. In this first chunk, that's King Cyrus telling Zebel to take his people to return to Israel and to rebuild the kingdom. The second thing that they experience is resistance. Each of the men we'll look at in these two books are doing something different, but each time they start that, they begin to find resistance. Sometimes, that is from the non-exiled Jews, I told you that would be important, who have been living here for 70 years and say, you can't just come in and do whatever you want because you were exiled. It doesn't make you better than us. We are chosen people just as you are. We've been here. We want to be a part of this. Uh, sometimes it's from outsiders. Remember, it's been 70 years. So this chunk of the Middle East has not just been sitting, waiting with nothing happening, uh, hoping that the Israelites would come back and reestablish their kingdom. Uh, leaders have risen and fallen. Kingdoms have grown and fallen apart. And there's a lot of movement of people and armies and information through this region. Uh, so sometimes outsiders are going to say to these Israelites who are returning, well, no, you don't just get to come back and say this is our land. We're here now. This is our home just as much as it is, as it is yours. You don't get to do whatever you want. And sometimes the resistance is internal strife. They can't figure out what they want to do. They argue with one another. They fight with one another. Uh, and it causes them trouble. And sometimes it's a combination of all three. Um, 
or a combination of two, or just one alone. But they always meet resistance. And then the third thing that happens is an anticlimax. There will be this resistance. They will find a solution to the resistance. And then the story just kind of ends without climax. This happens three times. First with Salafael, then with Ezra, and then with Nehemiah. Uh, but it's also the literary style of the entire book. And you'll see at the end, it just kind of ends and leaves you going, did I miss a page? Is something stuck? Where's, <laughs> where's the big finish? You know, Where do we answer all the questions? Where do I get to the meat of the story? It just never happens. So this is the pattern of Ezra and Nehemiah. So let's look at how it works out for Zerubbabel. We already know the first step is Cyrus telling him to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. He takes 50,000 people, he returns to Jerusalem, and he decides, okay, time to rebuild this temple. This is what we're sent here. And at the end of chapter 3, we're told that the temple is finished being built. And so if you look to chapter 3, verse 10, uh, we can see uh, that they're making quick progress and have not yet run into resistance. When the builders laid the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests clothed in their vest and carrying their trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph with cymbals, arose to praise the Lord according to the directions of Israel's King David. They praised and gave thanks to the Lord, singing responsibly, He is good, His graciousness for Israel lasts forever. So they laid the foundation, getting ready to put up walls and finishing touches, but the foundation of the temple is done, and they're celebrating this big feat, this big step of progress. All of the people shouted praise to the Lord because the foundation of the Lord's house had been laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and heads of families who had seen the first house wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this house, although many others shouted loudly with joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people weeping, because the people rejoiced very loudly. The sound was heard at a great distance. So the question is, why are these elders weeping? Because they see the foundation. And there's two possible answers. Some people say, well, they're so happy that the foundation is being laid, that they're just, they're crying. They're breaking down emotionally and crying. Um, but that doesn't say that it's a joyful weeping. Uh, it's not tears of joy flow down the elder's face. Uh, it's this weeping. And you can't hear the weeping over the sound of joy, which makes most scholars and kind of bibl biblical scholars say it's different. The leaders, the elders who knew the first house, are disappointed in what they're seeing. Remember all the way back to uh, Deuteronomy and to Kings and to Leviticus, we hear all the time uh, uh, this story of the temple as being a place in which God's spirit is. Remember when they first finished the temple, God's spirit, like a cloud, moves from the tabernacle, the tent he had been living in for hundreds of years, goes into the temple, and it's so powerful that only the purest of priests can get close to the presence of God. It's powerful, uh, it's majestic. And that's not happening here. The elders expect as the new temple is built, the presence of God will reappear, and it doesn't. And they knew what it was like to see the temple in its full glory, and now they're starting to understand that it may not get back to where it was, and that's heartbreaking. Now, the new generation who had never seen it has nothing to compare it to. They're thinking, hey, this is great. We're doing exactly what we were told to do. But for those who had seen it before, there's a layer of disappointment embedded within it. Now, in chapter 4, we move on to step 2, resistance. Foundation is laid, so now resistance is going to come. And we'll just start in verse 1. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the families and said to them, Let's build with you, for we worship your God as you do, and we've been sacrificing to him ever since the day of Assyria's king, Asher Haddon, who brought us here. So here... We have people who are non-exiled Israelites who worship this Jewish God saying, we think it's great that you're rebuilding the temple to the same God that we worship. Let us build it with you. We want to help. We were sent here by the Assyrian exile. We'd love to pitch in. And then in verse 3, we get the res response. <laughs> but Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the families in Israel reply, you'll have no part in Israel, or you'll have no part with us in building a house for our God. We alone will build because the Lord, the God of Israel, and Persia's King Cyrus commanded us. So this us versus you dichotomy. 
the non-exiled feeling like they have a special right to build this temple because God, through Cyrus, had asked them, not those who were fortunate enough to remain in the Promised Land during the exile. The neighboring peoples discouraged the people. The neighboring peoples discouraged the people of Judah, made them afraid to build, and bribed officials to frustrate their plan. They did this throughout the rule of Persia's king Cyrus until the rule of Persia's king Darius. So these guys, these tribes who have been told by the exiled Israelites, no, you're not good enough to help us build the temple to our shared God, say, fine, we'll get in your way. If you don't want to play ball, we don't want to play ball. And so we can do everything in our power to make this hard for you. And they do that using the bureaucracy of the Babylonian Empire. Now, Israel, when they're freed, it doesn't get to go back and be an independent kingdom. Persia owns it's a region, uh, you can think of it as a state within the Persian Empire, uh, but if King Cyrus says something, the Israelites living in Jerusalem have to listen to King Cyrus, or he shows up at his PowerPoint in his army and tells them why they need to listen to what he tells them to do. So it's not like they get free from the exile and there's no more socio-political activity happening around them. They're still part of this broader empire, and the people they told could help use that empire to their advantage. And so in chapter 4, Verse 9, we read this letter that the discouraged neighbors of the Israelites in Jerusalem write to King Artaxerxes. From Rehum, the royal deputy, and Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their colleagues, the judges, the administrators, the officials, the Persians, the people of Arak, the Babylonians, the people of Susa, and the rest of the nations from the great and famous Osnapper, deported and settled in the cities of Samaria and in the rest of the province beyond the river. This is a copy of the letter they sent to him. So a big band of people is getting together, angry at the Israelites in Jerusalem, saying, we're going to write this letter. We're in chapter 4, verse 11 now. This is a copy of the letter they sent to him, King Artaxerxes. To King Artaxerxes, from your servants, the people of the province beyond the river, that's Israel, may it be known to the king that the Jews who left you and came to us have arrived in Jerusalem. They are rebuilding the rebellious and wicked city, they are completing the walls and repairing the foundations. May it be known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and the walls completed, they will not pay tribute or tax or dues, and the royal revenue will be reduced. Since we receive our salary from the palace, and since it is not fitting for us to witness the king's dishonor, we now send this letter and inform the king so that you may search the records of your ancestors. You will discover in the records that this is a rebellious city harmful to kings and provinces, and that it has been in revolt over a long <coughs> period of time. As a result, this city was laid to waste. We tell the king that if the city is rebuilt and its walls completed, you will then have no possession in the province beyond the river. So all these surrounding tribes, having been dissed by the Israelites in Jerusalem, write this letter to King Artaxerxes and kind of conveniently leave out the fact that they were willing to help them rebuild the foundation and the walls in the city and tell the king that this rebellious and wicked people the Jews whose city was destroyed because of how terrible they are to kings and empires are trying to rebuild their city. And we do not want to dishonor you, the king, because they told us we couldn't. And so we want you to know that if they finish this building, they will rebel against you, you'll lose your money, you'll lose the province, and we just couldn't stand to see that happen. And if you're the king in Persia, thousands of miles away, you read this letter and think, huh, we should probably dig into that. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, Artaxerxes responds in chapter... Yes? Are we having a little bit of that in our church today? Threats of what might happen if we don't do what the vote was? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're really good as humans at asking for something, not getting what we want, and then threatening to undermine what we did get, right? So... We see that displayed in, in human nature, in faith, in politics, in society. Um, you know, here, the story is these people wanted to be a part of the group. And the Israelites said, no, you can't be part of our group. So they said, okay, if you won't let us be part of your group, we'll destroy your group. Um, and there's lots of parallels to many things in our lives, right? It's, we like to do the same. Uh-huh. So they write this letter uh, in the hopes that they'll stop the building, that uh, they can bring down the group that said no to them being a part of it. So an Artaxerxes response, and you can see that in chapter 4, verse 17. Artaxerxes, he said, uh, King Ptolemy 
Yes. Uh, it goes Cyrus, Darius, Xerxes, Artaxerxes, and kind of ends there because uh, the Greeks beat up on the Persians. And that's Darius was fast. Yes. Yes, you're right. King Xerxes, King Cyrus, Xerxes, Artaxerxes, Darius. And Darius is the final king beaten by the Greeks, and then the empire say. kind of falls apart. But that's a different history lesson in a, in a different class. Uh -huh. Uh, but King Artaxerxes comes after King Cyrus. Right? So Cyrus has died, Artaxerxes is now on the throne, and he is writing back to these tribes, to these people who have told him that the Jews are building up their empire and will rebel against him. Greetings to Rehum, the royal deputy, and Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their colleagues who live in Samaria and elsewhere in the province beyond the river. The entire letter that you sent to me has been read in translation for me. They don't speak the same language, so scribes are translating. Uh, I issued an order. They searched and discovered that this city has revolted against kings over a long period of time. There has been much rebellion and revolt there. However, there have been mighty kings over Jerusalem who have also ruled over the whole province beyond the river. Tribute and taxes and dues were paid to them. Therefore, issue an order to stop these people. The city is not to be rebuilt until I make a decree. Be sure to carry out this order. Why should danger grow and threaten the king? And so Artaxerxes replies, we have a little more digging to do. We do see evidence that the Israelites are rebellious and can resist the rule of kings. But I also see that strong kings can control these people, and I believe myself to be a very strong king. Uh, so let's put a halt to it. We'll, we'll stop it. We'll wait for my go-ahead before you move on. And so this goes back to those tribes, and they are so eager to sprint to the Israelites in Jerusalem and say, Hey, we've got a letter from the king. He said you can't build it. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> you stop right in your tracks. Artaxerxes says no. And again, in Jerusalem, they have to listen because you don't make the king of Persia mad. He rules your region. And so, it stops. And in chapter 5, we're introduced to a prophet, uh, two actually, Haggai and Zechariah. And they prophesy to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem that they're going to be able to build God's house, that the temple will be allowed, uh, that Artaxerxes will let them do it. And so, we get another letter from Artaxerxes that is going to fill this prophecy. And then it gets a little confusing, because it's back to King Darius. Okay? Um, why? Probably a literary mistake, a misunderstanding of how things fall. Or, enough time has passed that Artaxerxes has died and Darius has taken the throne. Okay? Uh, so one of two options. Maybe confusion on timeline by the author, or just a big enough chunk of time has passed between the first letter going back and this letter getting back, and it takes a long time to send letters in the ancient world. Uh, but third king in the picture here, King Darius on the throne, and so they write to King Darius. Okay. Uh, in writing to King Darius is a governor of the province beyond the river. Okay, So there are governors of these provinces, and he's writing back to his king. And so we can pick up that story in chapter 5. Verse 7. In the message they sent him, the following was written. To King Darius, all peace. Let the king know that we went to the province of Judah, to the house of the great God. It is being built with dressed stone and with timber set into the walls. This, works make, this work makes good progress and prospers in their hands. We asked those elders who authorized you to build this house and to complete the preparation of this material. We also asked them their names so that they could write down the names of the leaders for your information. So this governor has been sent by the king's people to do a fact-finding mission. And so he goes to Jerusalem, and he starts asking questions about the palace. And he sees that the foundation is laid, and he asks the rulers, you know, who are you, which families are you the head of? I need some information to get back to the king before we can let you keep building this temple. This was their reply to us, verse 11. Now. We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth. We are rebuilding the house that was built many years ago, which a great king of Israel built and completed. But because our ancestors angered the God of heaven, he gave them over into the power of Babylon's king Nebuchadnezzar, the Chaldean who destroyed this house and deported the people to Babylonia. However, in the first year of his rule, Babylon's king Cyrus issued a decree to rebuild this house of God. King Cyrus also took the gold and silver equipment from God's house out of the temple in Babylon and gave them to a man named Shesh Bazar, whom he had appointed governor. Cyrus said to him, Take this equipment and go and put it in Jerusalem's temple, and let God's house be rebuilt on its original site. And now, uh, jumping ahead to verse 17. 
And now, if it seems good to, be, to the king, may a search be made in the royal archives in Babylon to see if King Cyrus has issued a decree to rebuild this house of God in Jerusalem. Then may the king be pleased to send us a decision about this matter. Okay. So, first, in the resistance, there's this request to help build the temple from the non-exiled to the exiled. The exiled say to the non-exiled, nope, you can't be a part of this new group. You don't get to help us build the house. They say, fine, we'll get in your way using red tape. They send a letter to one king, Artaxerxes, and say, these people are rebellious, and if you let them rebuild their temples and their walls and their city, they'll rebel against you, and you will lose power, and you don't want that to happen. Artaxerxes says, hit pause, let me do some fact-finding, figure out what's going on, and assigns this governor, who is now writing back to King Darius, to go and do that fact-finding mission. And what he's found in talking to the Israelites is that this was an original decree from King Cyrus. And so he writes back to the King Darius and says, if King Cyrus told them to do this, then we have to let them finish it. A Persian king told them to do this, it has to be done. So what I need you to do is go to the royal library, see if you can find the decree from King Cyrus that told them to build this temple. And if they did so, my recommendation to you is to let them build it. And this is taking years gone through three monarchs now, it is taking decades for this all to get figured out, which is exactly what the non-exiled people wanted to cause, right? We're slowing down the whole process. We're just filling it up with mud. We're filibustering, okay? We're getting in the way every way we can. But finally, in chapter 6, Darius responds to the Israelites in Jerusalem. And I love the way my translation at least starts in verse 2. A memorandum. King Darius is writing a memo to the people of Israel. In the first year of his rule, King Cyrus made a decree concerning God's house in Jerusalem. Let the house at the place where they offered sacrifices be rebuilt, and let its foundations be retained. And then he goes into exactly what King Cyrus told them to make the house out of, how high it was supposed to be, how big it was going to be. Um, but in it, we can jump to uh, verse 11 of chapter 6. Well, actually, we can go a little bit back. Uh, let's, let's go to verse 6. Now you, Tatanai, governor of the province beyond the river, Shethar, Boznai, and you, their colleagues, the officials of the province beyond the river, keep away. Let the work on this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild this house of God on its original site. And then he issues some decree saying, not only are we going to let them alone, we're going to help them do this. This was a decree from King Cyrus. We're going to give them the resources they need to make this happen. And, and he decrees that if anyone disobeys, a beam is to be pulled out of the house of the guilty party, and the guilty party will then be impaled on it. You can read that in chapter 11. Someone gets in their way, I want you to walk into their living room, pull a two-by-four out of the wall, and impale them on it. Okay? We're going to let the Israelites rebuild the house of God. It's not just something God wants them to do, it's something Persia wants them to do, and that's far more important. And so, we move from resistance to the anti-climax. Decades have passed. The non-exiled people have really gotten in the way of the exiled people's hope to rebuild the temple. So we expect the triumphant building of the temple, the crushing of the non-exiled people, just this triumphant moment for those who were exiled and got slowed down. But God's house is built. They do a small ceremony. They celebrate. And that's the end of this first chunk of the story. This anti-climax. They, they finish, and then they move on. And you can find that there at the end of chapter 6. And then we get to chapter 7, and Ezra is introduced. No finality to the relationship between the exiled and non-exiled Israelites. Uh, no story about how they did or didn't come to terms on what their future would be. Just, and then we finished the, the temple and had a kid festival and celebrated, played a little trumpet, and it was fine. And that's it. It's anticlimactic end to this story. It seems like it's been building up, building up. Kings are talking, and, and governors, and important people, and then it's done. And here comes Ezra, the second of the three people that falls through this loop. Now, Ezra is back in Persia. Remember, each of these three stories starts with a Persian king saying to an Israelite, go home, do something. There's a need for you, so I want you to do it. And Ezra is a Torah scholar, so he studies the Torah and the Jewish scriptures. He's a scholar in the Torah, an expert in what it tries to teach the Jews. And so the king of Persia says, go back to Israel and reteach them the Torah. Clearly these people have forgotten their faith. Uh, reteach it to them, lead them in a spiritual revival, help them understand their God and their relationship with their God. 
and this is King Artaxerxes. So, interestingly, this happens in the middle of that fight over the temple. Because again, it takes time to get from the capital of Persia back to Jerusalem. So Artaxerxes sends Ezra back to Jerusalem uh, with the hope that he will kind of reinvigorate their faith. Now, Ezra is a good guy. He prays often. He is in relationship with God. He tries to be true to God. Uh, but he also has a temper. When Ezra arrives in Jerusalem, uh, he's been told, he is told, that the people have been intermarrying. And if we go back to Deuteronomy and Leviticus, uh, we see that that's a no-no. The Israelites are supposed to stay pure. They're not supposed to marry other people with other gods because that would be a corrupting influence on them. And so what they've found is that exiled and non-exiled Israelites have married each other, um, but also Israelites and other tribes have been marrying each other. And Ezra does not handle the news well. Turn to Ezra chapter 9, verses uh, 1 through 4. When these tasks were finished, the officials approached me and said, and here it's interesting, we get into a first person account, and so the author is writing as if he is Ezra. Uh, the author also writes Nehemiah as a first person account. Not these people writing their own story, uh, but an author kind of putting himself in that position. We, we don't know. Um, we know that, well, they believe that the same person wrote both because of the literary style, but they're not sure who the author was. That's one of the frustrations of some of these old texts is we just we don't know. The people of Israel, the priests and the Levites, haven't kept themselves separate from the peoples of the neighboring lands with their detestable practices, namely the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. So uh, they just married everyone. They've taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, and the holy descendants have become mixed with the neighboring people. The right? holy descendants, the gods, who started to kind of mix up which god we're supposed to be worshiping. Moreover, the officials and leaders have led the way into this unfaithfulness. So it's not just, you know, little Joe Tim running his farm who doesn't know better. It's, it's the judges, it's the rulers, it's the people in charge that are leading this unfaithfulness. That's a problem. When I heard this, I tore my clothes and cloak pulled out hair from my head and beard, and sat down in shock. He throws a full-sized tantrum, rips up his clothes, pulls out his hair, and sits down in shock. Then all those who trembled at the words of the God of Israel gathered around me on account of the transgression of the returned exiles, while I remained sitting in shock until the evening sacrifice. So this is his resistance. Ezra comes back at the order of King Artaxerxes and says, we have to live based on the rule. I'm a Torah expert. You don't want to challenge me on this. But God tells us we have to live based on the Torah. And these people start coming forward and saying, that's great, but I'm married. I have a family and a life with someone who's not an Israelite. And so his resistance is these people saying, yeah, we live in harmony with God, but give us a little bit of wiggle room. Man, you don't want me to get divorced, do you? And that's also not biblical. And Ezra goes, no, that's exactly what I want you to do. Ezra and the elders of Israel decide that this is such a crisis that the only solution is to order a divorce decree. That everyone who is married to one of these other people must divorce and send the women and children of the relationship out into the wilderness, back to where they came from. Right? And so Ezra and the elders get together and make this decree. And this part of the story, Ezra ends with the elders getting back and creating a very short list of people who actually follow this decree. Again, the anti-climax. It all peaks with this big gathering of the Israelites, and they say, what are you going to make us do? And he says, divorce. I want you to leave your families, tear them apart, that way you can be one with God. And then most people go, no, we're not going to do that. And so these last verses of chapter uh, 10 are the very few families who actually follow through on the divorce work, right? And so they promised to send their wives away, and their compensation offering was a ram of the flock of their field. That's uh, chapter 10, verse 19. And then 20 through 44 is this list of men who do that. It's not a very long list. We know that there's hundreds of thousands of Israelites living in Jerusalem now. And that's a list of less than a paragraph. Or two. So here comes this big decree from Ezra and the elders of Israel. And most people go, craggy. We're, we're not going to do that. I'm not leaving my wife and my children and tearing apart my life. And it's this really weird uh, kind of crisis within the story. Ezra is supposed to be this great leader of the Israelites, yet he's telling them to do something against the Torah to realign with the Torah. 
And as we read into the prophets, what we'll find is that the prophets overlay on this history. And so as this is happening, the prophet Malachi is speaking, and we'll read Malachi later on in the class. But Malachi says, yeah, we're supposed to obey God, but God detests divorce. You can't make these people divorce. The other problem with what Ezra does is that God never asks Ezra to do it. God is not guiding Ezra at this point. It's the elders of Israel making a decision. And so this is a non-God-infused act uh, that doesn't fully incorporate the teachings of Torah into the decision they're trying to make. And it doesn't work. And it's anticlimactic, and the book ends with a short list of people who actually follow through. Now for guy number three, Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the cupbearer to the king of Persia. Um, it's an important role. It's an honorable role. But Nehemiah hears that the walls in Israel are falling apart, and he just can't have it. Right? Walls in the ancient world protect your city. If you don't have walls, cavalry can crash right in, burn down your houses, burn down your buildings. You, know, you need walls and you need gates to protect yourself. And so in chapter 1, verse 1 of Nehemiah, uh, a report is sent to him. Why to Nehemiah? Who knows? Uh, but a report is sent to him, and we can see the words of it here. These are the words of Nehemiah, Hazaliah's son. In the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the fortress city of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers came with some other men from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had escaped and survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. They told me, those in the province who survived the captivity are in great trouble and chain. The wall around Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been destroyed by fire. And so Nehemiah is just consumed by this news. Uh, he is sad by it. He is worried about it. And so that night, he goes into the king's chamber with the cup, bearing the cup of the king. And because the king had never seen him sad before, uh, he asks, why are you sad? Nehemiah is kind of wearing his, his heartache on his clothes. And the king can see it, and he says, what's wrong, Nehemiah? Uh, how can I help? I, I want to be your buddy here. Well, what's going on? And Nehemiah prays to God and then tells the king, the walls of Jerusalem have broken down. My people are in danger. Uh, they've been shamed by this lack of infrastructure. I'd really like your permission to go and to rebuild the walls. And the king, in style of the literary fashion of the book, says, okay, go back to Israel, take what you need. I'll even give you armed guards to get you there and make sure that when you get to Jerusalem, you're safe and you can build this wall. Okay? And so Nehemiah is released by the king, and he goes back to build the wall. And immediately we, we start to get some friction in the story. The first is the friction that comes from the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah, when he spoke about the end of the captivity, said that after the captivity was done, a messianic king would come and rule over all nations, and that Jerusalem would be a city without walls. If you're going to build a kingdom for all nations, you don't want a wall that keeps people out of it. You want people to be able to come and to experience the kingdom of God so you don't need walls if this messianic king is going to come. And so people begin to question, in building walls, are we ignoring the call of the prophecy? Do we make it harder for the messianic king to do what he needs to do to rule over all people if we tell certain groups that, no, you can't come into our city? It's holy just for us. Is that really what we're supposed to be doing? Um, and of course, the other tribes, the other peoples in the region, hear that Israel is rebuilding its walls and wonder why. Why do you think you need walls? Sometimes walls are built for defense if you're scared that an empire is just going to come in and attack you. But Persia runs everything around here. So are you building those walls because you're going to start attacking people and might need to protect yourself? Are you going to try to insulate yourself and uh, take yourself out of the rest of the world? What, what is the point of your walls? And so these people start to ask questions. And Nehemiah, similar to the other two, says, don't ask any questions. You don't get to be a part of this. We are doing this. You don't get asked questions, so be quiet, turn around, and leave. And of course, this furthers the anger being felt by outsiders. And eventually, it gets to the point that Nehemiah has to have armed guards protect the people who are building his wall. Again, probably not the image of the messianic kingdom that the Jews had been hoping for. Right? We need armed guards to protect the city that we're walling in when we want this to be a kingdom of all nations where people can come and experience the glory and the love of God. That seems weird. But Nehemiah completes the building of the walls. He believes that he has secured Israel. And to his credit, he does that well. Nehemiah believes 
wholeheartedly in what he is doing. He does it with great character and with poise and with care. Um, but there's lots of questions about whether or not that's really what was supposed to happen or whether or not it needed to happen. Uh, are these conflicts necessary or is this the Israelites uh, just doing what they want to again and ignoring that call and that pull from God? Okay. Uh, so the resistance is from the other people, these other kingdoms, and the anti-climax is Ezra hires some bodyguards and they finish the wall. They celebrate the building of the wall and in chapter 8 of Nehemiah, we're going to jump ahead because we don't need to read all about the construction of the wall. It gets built. Uh, but in chapter 8, they've finished the wall. Uh, they've finished the, saint, the temple. They've rebuilt the foundations. Uh, and so it's time to really celebrate what we've done. And so Ezra is still alive. And he and Nehemiah team up because they're going to lead a spiritual revival of these Israelites. They've forgotten their God. They've forgotten how to live in harmony with God. So we're going to team up. We're going to use these celebrations as an opportunity to really talk about our relationship with God. Uh, and that is a great sentiment for us. So chapters 8 through 12 are kind of the positive ending of the book. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah do a seven-day straight lecture on the Torah. Right? It's this class on steroids. <laughs> uh, for seven days, they hold the people of Jerusalem captive and talk to them about the Torah and tell them why the Torah is important and re-institute the rules of the Torah. In that process, they sacrifice great things to God. Uh, the people of Jerusalem recommit to their covenant with God. They say, ah, oh, we get it now. You told us about it for seven days. We understand what you're talking about. We'll recommit to our covenant. Um, they celebrate, again, the Feast of the Tabernacle. They're back in the seventh month. They confess their sins. They renew that covenant. They vow to follow the Torah. And they celebrate the glory of God that they see rebuilt in the temple and in the walls, and in their freedom from the Babylonian captivity. And so as you read chapters 8 and 12, and read about these celebrations, and uh, read about all the ways in which the Israelites are learning their lesson, you think, maybe they've got it. Maybe after 70 years of exile from the promised land, they've figured it out. Throughout the Old Testament, we've seen this choice given to the people from God to obey. This is dead. <laughs> to obey or to disobey, right? Do we choose God, or do we choose our own needs, our own desires, our own selves? And as you read 8 through 12, and you hear them reread the words of Moses, and recommit to the original covenant with God, and say, we're going to follow the Torah, we're going to listen to the rules, we're going to obey God and choose Him over the things that we want, you think, oh, there's hope. Maybe they figured it out. Maybe after all this time, starting back in Exodus, where as soon as they crossed the Red Sea, they started doing things wrong after having literally watched a miracle happen. Maybe now, hundreds, centuries later, they figured it out. Uh, but then the book ends on a big bummer. Right? It turns out they didn't. Uh, very quickly, they go back to their old faults. They begin to disobey. They begin to choose themselves over God. And we can picture, get that picture in chapter 13. So in chapter 13, Nehemiah is out kind of walking the town. Right? He wants to do an inspection. After the big celebration and the week-long lecture, he actually returns to Persia. Uh, remember, he works for the king, and so this was a short-term assignment, and he goes back to Persia, but he misses home. And so he says to the king, I want to go back. I want to make my life there. I want to be with my people. Um, for a short time, Nehemiah had been the governor of Jerusalem, and so the king said, yeah, you can go back. I'll find another guy to hold my cup. Uh, and so <laughs> Nehemiah returns, uh, and he walks around the city to see how great things have been going since his absence. And of course, things aren't going well in his absence. First, the temple has become neglected, uh, and unqualified people are in charge of it. That's chapter 13, verse 10. And again here, uh, this author really likes writing in the first person, so now Nehemiah again in the first person. I also found out that the Levites hadn't been given their portions, so they and the singers who did the work had gone back to their fields. So I scolded the officials, asking, why is God's house being neglected? I gathered them together and set them in their stations. And so he walks in and he realizes that the high priesthood, the Levites, have not been paid enough, and so they've left the temple to go back to their field to provide for their families. Uh, and in their place, just kind of random people have tried to take care of the temple, but it's got lots of cobwebs in the corner, and the candles have 
not been replaced, and the floor needs mopping, it, it's been neglected. And so he gives them a good chewing and asks them why, and says, no, we're going to pay the Levites, I'm going to get them straightened back up. And chapter 14, remember me, my God, concerning this. Don't erase my good deeds that I have done for my God's house and for his services. So Nehemiah says, wow, these guys screwed up. Uh, God, remember how hard I worked. Don't discourage me. Don't forget me and my good deeds just because everyone else messed up. And that's the first of a few times Nehemiah will say, God, this isn't my fault. Forgive me for, you know, remember that I did my very best and that they have failed you. Then we see that workers are ignoring the Sabbath uh, and begin to marry poor women. And we can find that in Nehemiah 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 15. In those days, I saw people in Judah using the wine presses on the Sabbath. They were also collecting piles of grain and loading them on donkeys, as well as wine, grapes, figs, and every kind of load, and then bringing them to Jerusalem on the Sabbath. I warned them at that time against selling food. In addition, people from Tyre who lived in the city were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them to the people of Judah on the Sabbath. This happened in Jerusalem itself. So I scolded the officials of Judah. So Nehemiah sees, oh, people are ignoring the court again. They're working on the Sabbath. We're explicitly told not to do that. Jeff's sermon from a couple of weeks ago was all about the importance of the Sabbath. It's one of the commandments. It's more explained than any of the others. God values the Sabbath, and the people are working on what is supposed to be their Sabbath day. Nehemiah doesn't like this. He tells them that they're all wrong. And then he says, God, remember that I did my very best. Don't punish me for what they did wrong. I just want to make sure I'm covered here. I do things right. And then in chapter 13, verse 23, we hear about the intermarrying. Also in those days, I saw Jews who had married women of Ashad, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashad, or the language of various peoples. They couldn't speak the language of Judah. So I scolded them and cursed them, and beat some of them, and pulled out their hair. I've been to a lot of leadership seminars. <laughs> Beating and pulling out of hair is rarely something that you know, the speaker introduces to the people. I also made them swear a solemn pledge in the name of God, saying, You won't give your daughters to their sons in marriage, or take their daughters in marriage for your sons yourselves. Did Israel's king Solomon sin on account of such women? Among the many nations there was no king like him. He was well loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Yet foreign wives led even him into sin. Should we then listen to you and do all this great evil, acting unfaithfully toward our God, marrying foreign women? Now one of the sons of Joadiah, son of the high priest Elishib, was a son-in-law of Sanballat the Hornite. So I chased him away from me. Remember them, my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priests and the Levites. Look, God, at all the things they've done wrong. Gross. So I purified them of everything foreign and established the services of the priests and Levites with specific duties for each person. I also provided for the wood offering at appointed times as well as for the early produce. Remember me, my God, for good. So here is Nehemiah is, is telling his story. He's done everything right. Everything, everyone else has done everything wrong. He did his very best to figure it out. And that's the end of the book. So the lesson is to stay away from foreign women. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, the end of the book is this anti-climax. Right? Nehemiah kind of says, God, they screwed up. Don't punish me for it. And that's it. Yeah. Um, okay. They weren't supposed to marry foreigners because foreigners had foreign gods. Yeah. Okay. So the Israelites were afraid that they, the Israelites would start wash, worshiping those gods. Mm -hmm. Why did they not consider their religion strong enough to pull people from those gods over to their god? That's a good question. A part of it comes from the reality of the kings. And so when we go back to those stories of, of kings, uh, and look at Solomon in particular, and, and Nehemiah speaks to that, uh, this king, this great king who loved God, uh, begins worshiping other gods because of his wives. They blame it on the wives. Solomon could have done things on his own, uh, but culturally it's pretty easy to blame things on the wives. The reality is that there's probably lots of situations among average people where an Israelite marries a Moabite, and the Moabite finds faith in God. We see that story in our own lives all the time. A Christian marries someone that is that has little faith or is of different faith, and they find God, right, through their relationship. Uh, those stories don't matriculate their way into it. They're focused on these big overarching kings, and so those little stories in which lives are transformed rarely make their way into the Bible. 
Uh, and so those fears are more associated to society as a whole than I think they are to individuals. Right? This happened to one king, we don't want it to happen to another one, uh, so we're just going to outlaw it altogether. Does that make some sense? It explains it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's I'll probably, yeah, that's good. response. So yeah. why does the book come to an anti-climax? We've seen this a couple of times now in the Old Testament. Chronicles kind of had this anti-climax where it just ends, and it ends in a disappointment. Once again, the Israelites have failed to live in harmony with God. They've continued to choose their own needs, their own desires, their own wants over God. Why does that keep happening? Most people would argue that that's because Nehemiah and Ezra and these early Israelites after their turn work really hard to change the politics, uh, to change society, but they never take the time to change their hearts. They never really take the time to figure out what is in the way of their relationship with God. This also sets the stage for the Messiah. Right? It's further proof that on their own, human beings cannot overcome their internal desire to fulfill their own needs for God. So the hope is not in our ability to overcome these challenges, but the hope is in that messianic king who will come and who will unite the nations and who will offer a different path forward. This path of love, this path of grace, this path of opportunity that reconciles us with God. And so this is the end of the history, and it's still a couple hundred years before Christ returns, but the hope for the Israelites is still that as we continue to screw up, eventually this messianic king will come and show us the way. We fail over and over and over again, but eventually someone else will come and we'll figure this thing out. So in many ways, these books are laying the groundwork for what becomes our New Testament, right? that triumphant arrival of Jesus, his new way of understanding the world and relationships in God, and the way in which he offers us to live in a harmony differently than the Old Testament does. So this is kind of groundwork laying, and we're a long ways away from getting into the Testament in this group, uh, but eventually these tie together very powerfully. Any more questions tonight? I'm sure there are a lot. Yeah, Carl. Well, there was a period of time when the Persians were the leaders, the artisans, the scholars, and everything else. Was this at the same time coincidence or should the Israelites be mixing in with the Persians? Yeah, and, um, and in different ways, right? So there's lots of Israelites back in the Persian heartland who never leave during the, when the exile is done uh, because they've married Persian people, they've got Persian clothes, they like the Persian lifestyle. Um, and back in Israel, there's lots of Persians, and then the Persians fall and the Greeks take over, so there's lots of Greeks. And this intermarrying and this mix of cultures, especially in this portion of the world at this time, is constant. Right? And then the Greeks fall and the Romans come in, and there's um, an assimilation that happens. Uh, we'll see in the prophecies... Uh, that the Israelites often viewed how they respond to empires and to different influences in two dichotomous ways. They would either resist and rebel, or they would fully assimilate. Right? They'd go, ah, we can't win, so let's just do as the Romans do. Uh, but some of the prophets offer a, a middle path, a third way, and it's the same way that Jesus treats empires. Right? Christ says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Right? You don't have to fight back against Caesar. Give him back his coins. But don't treat Caesar like he's a god. You can live in his society, but remember that God is God, and that he is more important. And some of the prophets, and we'll talk about them here in the coming weeks, say, yeah, I mean, we'll work with the Babylonians, and we'll do what the Babylonians ask us to, but we're going to remember that God is God, and we're going to worship God, and we're going to do what God commands us to. That doesn't mean we have to rebel, but we kind of quietly maintain our own faith in the face of these other empires. Right? So there's kind of different sects of Jewish tradition. Uh, some become increasingly traditional because other empires sweep in and try to change their culture, and so they stick really hard to their foundations. Um, others just give up and kind of interact with whatever culture is sweeping in at the time, and they're Greek when it's popular to be Greek, and they're Roman when it's popular to be Roman, and they do what they have to do. And then there's this third group who says, well, we're going to understand the empire in charge. We're going to pay taxes. You know, we don't want to get killed and pillaged. But we're also going to value our faith and worship our God and live in harmony with one another. And that is the same way that Jesus treats kind of our world empires. Right? And that still holds true today. Yes, the government of the United States matters, and we should follow the laws and render unto America what is America's. But 
God is still God, and that's important. Um, so, we're getting ahead of ourselves in that conversation, but different understanding there. Any other questions? Okay, I'll see you guys next week. We'll keep trucking along. Thank you.